today, it's、uh, equally exciting to have three outstanding speakers to join us、uh, to talk about their own research.、Uh, we have、uh, Professor Andrew Gam, Professor Judy Cha, and Professor Omar Yagi. So let us start from the first one. Let me introduce Andrew Gam first.、Uh, he's too well known. Really doesn't need introduction, but let me just mention a few things here. Certainly,、uh, one most important one. He was the winner of 2010、uh, Nobel Prize for、uh, graphene. But to maybe not everybody know, he also won the Ig Nobel Prize in 2000. That was 10 years earlier. He's probably the only person winning both Nobel Prize and Ig Nobel Prize.、Uh, he's probably the only person. That is、uh, really telling you he's a great scientist. At the same time, he's a really fun scientist as well.、Uh, he's a fellow of Royal Society.、Uh, he's also a foreign associate of、uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences, foreign member of Chinese Academy of Sciences. With that, I would let uh, Andrea uh, take the podium and start the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Do you hear me all right? I think everything should be on your screen. So that's not about.、Uh, Fun lecture. It's about、uh, the subject we have started about four or five years ago, and continue doing it very intensively in parallel with、uh, our usual stuff: electronic properties of two-dimensional materials. But、uh, as a new subject, this fascinates me most at the moment. So let me go directly to what we do. Ah,、uh, up.、Uh, oh. Everyone knows these days how to make graphene. I guess so. You take a piece of graphite and ex extract a two-dimensional plane, one single atom thick, by slicing this material, and usually forget about everything else. That's、uh, What many groups are doing around the world, either graphene or other two-dimensional materials, but you can change your mentality a little bit and ask yourself a question. So, what would、uh, be happening if we change、uh, the sequence instead of for forgetting a? About this big block of graphite, will forget about、uh, graphene and ask yourself a question: What is left behind? And what is left behind is quite obvious. If you extract a single atomic plane, you will have a pair of dislocation and an empty space、uh, in between. So you can consider is not as a two-dimensional material, but as two-dimensional anti-material. Or、uh, antipode of uh, uh, graphene, and、uh, this two-dimensional space probably has some properties we uh, contemplated, and uh, uh, it's interesting to see what those properties would be. So it's in, it's easy to make cartoons; it's harder to make the real devices and to make those.、Uh, Real devices. We use Van der Waals assembly, as many people know around the world. So、uh, usually you put、uh, different layers on top of each other. In our case, instead of a complete layer of some material, we put spaces, uh, short uh, stripes of other material. And that's our empty space we're interested in. Obviously, you can use different materials, whatever you choose, from mica,、uh, graphite, molybdenum disulfide, and so on. And you also can control、uh, the height of those channels, either choosing monolayer or bilayer or many layers of 
whatever material you put in between. So it looks simple uh, with the benefit of hindsight, but it took quite a few years to realize this uh, assembly. This is how it looks in reality. It's transmission electron micrograph of uh, cross section of our channels. In this case, we essentially extracted two graphene layers from bulk graphite, creating this angstrom scale capillary. We can also make a single layer capillaries, okay, only 3.5 angstroms. Those capillaries are not only atomically thin, they also have a, a flat balls, which is, which is important. Uh, uh, yeah, so we can make uh, whatever we want these days with those materials quite controllably, four layers, and what we consider macroscopic capillaries using like 40 layers, which is 10 nanometers. In our case, it's no longer angstrom size, but nanoscale physics, okay, yesterday day, if you, if you wish. So, uh, it's also relatively easy to make uh, those capillaries and their cross sections. It's much harder to do uh, experimental work on those. And to do this, we get rather complicated uh, devices, in which case we make a silicon nitride uh, thin membrane, put uh, uh, graphite on top or other material, put our spaces, etch everything, and then terminate this assembly, trilayer assembly, say with graphite or other material, and this is what I have shown you before. Those are subjects of our interest, atomic scale capillaries. Everything like this is assembled on top of uh, uh, silicon nitride uh, membrane on silicon chip. And uh, uh, because we're interested in like uh, atoms, ions, uh, molecules going through. This is our input container, this is our output container, and we measure molecular transport through those capillaries. That's the basic idea uh, of those capillaries and the basic idea how to do it in reality. So first of all, I spent a few slides trying to explain you what we have done, what is the status of this area uh, up to today. Uh, we first of all investigated the properties of this empty space. Obvious ca candidate is helium, how helium, uh, a simple atom goes through those capillaries and uh, uh, already uh, immediately, even with helium, uh, you see some strange effect. For example, if you make those atomic scale channels out of molybdenum disulfide completely, everything seems to be classical physics. It's uh, kind of close to what you expect from the classical nuts and flow when molecules go around and eventually go through those channels. But if you make capillaries out of uh, graphite or boron nitride, you get 100 times, sometimes 1000 times quicker flow than you can expect from classical physics. And this is just ex one example of many experiments what we have done. So interpretation of those experiments that if you take a usual atomically flat material like molybdenum disulfide, what's uh, happening with uh, even the simplest molecules, they bounce forward and backwards in this channel and because atomical flat is not really atomically flat because this is one angstrom scale bar. So there is modulation of the surface and those bumps create this chaotic motion of helium atom. And then you get from diffusive scattering what you expect for the nuts and flow and what we observe. But for the case of boron nitride and graphite, the walls are much smoother. They are of sub 
angstrom roughness. And in this case, if we see specula scattering and we know from additional experiments that even De Broglie wave lines makes those a little bit left from the bumps, they make them uh, quantum mechanical reflection, make the surface even smoother effectively. And this is why we see this uh, kind of ballistic flow whenever comes in, comes out and without any any essentially resistance, the same resistance as just a short opening makes. So after that, we also want to study how water flows through those two dimensional channels. It was uh, the first experiment actually four years ago, and it was pretty hard because we need to measure uh, with microgram precision over many days because we have tiny evaporation area, how water from a container goes through those capillaries, evaporates and container loses its weight. So I don't want to go uh, too much in detail about uh, uh, our results. This is one example what we observed. It's a weight loss as a function of channel length and uh, it seems uh, in this case it's uh, we put spaces three layers of graphene, 10 angstrom high channels and uh, everything worked fine and the main probably result out of all this research is that it's a very fast water flow up to one meter per second in those extremely narrow capillaries and it essentially tells us that water flows nearly frictionlessly through those capillaries effective slip lengths more than submicron uh, lengths so it's a, it's a, an interesting uh, frictionless uh, model uh, we have here to study. Uh, next step we have done, we study how ions go through logically a rather obvious step. Why it is interesting? Because we can say make channels uh, only one atom high. In this case, in our first paper, it was two atoms high. So we use either one atomic clay of molybdenum disulfide or bilayer graphene to make spaces. And this size 6.6 .6 angstrom in both cases is uh, 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 comparable to the size of ions uh, and obvious and comparable to the size of aquaporins, which are responsible for life. So it's an interesting problem to study how those slits would hinder the movement of ions uh, because of uh, lateral confinement. Uh, uh, I, it's example of our measurements. Again, I don't want you to forget about everything on this slide except, okay, this is what kind of cations we are used in our experiments and those red dots uh, show the mobility as a function of those cations uh, hydrated diameter. What you see uh, our slit is approximately this size, 6.6, 6.7 angstrom high and uh, K plus exhibits essentially no hindrance at all. It moves as easily as in the bulk water. But as we go to larger, only 50% or less larger ions there, uh, mobility within the channels is uh, exponentially suppressed uh, uh, and uh, uh, naively one would think that large ions wouldn't enter into those small channels because of steric exclusion but uh, in fact what we learn from this that ions not like hard balls not like billiard balls but more like tennis balls, they can a little bit squish and shed some of their uh, hydrated shells and go through those capillaries 
through. And there is a okay, kind of interest in anion cation asymmetry due to different interaction with the walls. But let me skip this one. You can all read this into, in, in those couple of papers. So now I want to switch gears. And instead of describing properties of uh, uh, this new system, I want to uh, use Armstrong scale channels uh, to revisit some quite well-known problems, I would say textbook problems. And uh, uh, one of those problems is uh, uh, properties of water. We know that water has a very high dielectric constant at room temperature, and this is essentially explains why it's such a great material to uh, solve and uh, uh, practically any inorganic salts and so on, because dielectric constant is essentially responsible for making those shells which separate different ions in the solution. Also, high dielectric constant is responsible for operation of many devices. One example is batteries and capacitance, where this uh, double lay is essentially uh, very much involves uh, the fact that dielectric constant is rather large. This is why water is used in many uh, capacitors or equivalent liquids are, are used in capacitance and batteries. And of course, water is very important in life. One example is protein folding. Proteins are folded, it's our machines which are responsible for our life. And to understand this protein folding, people usually mimic very accurately those machines and put uh, uh, proteins inside of some amorphous uh, uh, substance uh, they call water with dielectric constant 80 in many cases. How justifiable is it that we use macroscopic measurements on actually not even nano but molecular scale? So that's uh, a problem we addressed uh, a couple of years ago. Experiment looks like, like this. We intentionally used relatively thin top layer so it can sag inside due to interaction of the top layer with side walls. It's quite well-known phenomena. Uh, then we expose this uh, setup to water and found out that when water fills in those capillaries, the top layer becomes essentially flat. It's important in many cases to make sure that uh, uh, water fills those capillaries, you will see later while. So we use this sagging as a good indication that water inside those channels. Uh, and in this particular experiment, we use uh, this assembly of graphite, which serves as, a, as an electrode, and uh, everything else is uh, essentially boron nitride. Uh, dielectric, low K dielectric. So that's our uh, uh, channels in AFM, open part, and this is the top crystal. So if we go on the top crystal, initially we see some sagging, which we design intentionally. We expose the, those channels to water and see that this sagging nearly disappears. You can sometimes still see a bit of uh, sagging. And uh, after we have done this uh, topography FM measurements, we put uh, uh, dielectric imaging mode, our microscope in dielectric imaging mode, and we see underneath of boron nitride top crystal what is uh, properties in dielectric sense of uh, whatever fills those capillaries. And you see here bright images, it's water, high dielectric constant, those channels are quite microscopic, about 10 nanometers high. So now, next step, what we do, 
we start decreasing, start squeezing water inside those channels. When we go to the channels, which are approximately four nanometer high, what we see that there is no dielectric constant, but remember, we are 100% certain from our uh, setup that water fills the channels which are somewhere here. Still, water doesn't respond to apply electric field. And when we go even small, to smaller thicknesses, what we find out that uh, water gives negative constant with respect to boron nitride. And boron nitride have dielectric constant only 3.5. So water responds to electric field even less than boron nitride. And that's uh, quite uh, unusual. We can quantify all those data in terms of uh, out of plane dielectric constant. And as you see here from bulk uh, properties of water for 100 nanometer channels, we gradually go to water which is electrically dead non-polarizable, at least in one direction, perpendicular to the channels. And as I described in my introduction, it has implications for many field, uh, fields where microscopic uh, kind of dielectric constant, uh, constant of water is involved on this small scale. My second story in the last five minutes is about uh, uh, capillary condensation, another textbook phenomena. You know, if you have porous substance and if you uh, have kind of humidity outside, uh, water doesn't condense on flat surfaces, but it would condense inside narrow capillaries. So, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, phenomena, it's very hard to describe how important this phenomena, because whenever you have a, a rough surface or whenever you have small pores, water always condenses there in uh, uh, ambient humidity, this has implication of adhesion, friction, corrosion, lubrications, and uh, myriads of other uh, phenomena. If uh, 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 you are not interested in those phenomena, you might be still interested in plain sand castles. If uh, water evaporates, they are destroyed. So this water, uh, which is condensed there, creates capillary pressures, uh, which is thousand bars uh, high, and this keeps the sand uh, uh, together. So, uh, how we are doing about all those phenomena, scientifically speaking, and I would say pathetically, because we still describe this phenomena by century old Kelvin equation, which is written here, which contains surface uh, uh, tension of bulk water, its density, and it was derived, okay, 150 years ago on the basis of observation in uh, millimeter-sized uh, tubes, uh, where capillary condensation occurs at humidity 99.99%. Over those many decades, especially during the last five decades, there were many experiments which proved the validity of this equation down to 10 nanometer in size. And it seems to be satisfactory because, uh, yeah, this is what can we do and there is no contradiction to what we observe. So everyone seems to be satisfied by using Kelvin equation both in industry and uh, in science. But if you look what the parameter here in those brackets, it's 5.4 angstrom size. And this 5.4 angstrom size have two implications, very important. First of all, you can immediately see that in order to observe condensation under 
ambient relative humidity, you need actually slits 1.5 nanometer and the cylindrical pores less than three nanometer highs, much smaller than whatever experimentally have been tested before. So experiments, okay, kind of tested not really what happens in the real life. The second important point, when you're talking about this scale, it's comparable to the size of water molecules. And one has really question, how can you apply a macroscopic equation with all those macroscopic quantities like uh, curvature and so on uh, for, to the system where actually you have to take into account discreteness of structure of water. So we address this phenomena, which is, as I try to convey the message is very important, using the same kind of experiment, feeling capillaries and detecting when water fills those capillaries, uh, our experimental setup, and this is an example. We control humidity, at low humidity we see sagging, capillaries are empty from water when we increase uh, um, uh, humidity is uh, filled with water and capillaries become flat. We concentrate on mica capillaries, not graphite or molybdenum disulfide, because mica is highly hydrophilic material, it's easier to deal with. Uh, this is what we typically see at low humidity, nothing happens, then there is a kind of rapid change and gradual change. So we see a transition, this jump we attribute to capillary condensation in our uh, devices. This is what we like to understand and this will also understand this part, but let me skip uh, this explanation. It's capillary pressures, which we also uh, studied a little bit, but so what we are interested in now, where this transition occurs as a function of a height of our capillaries, which change capillary height, and this is what we observe. There is, okay, error bars obviously, but not very, very large. And first surprise comes when we compare this with the traditional Kelvin equation, okay, which is 150 years old, and we put uh, surface tension of water, contact angle doesn't matter much as long as it is hydrophilic materials, density of water, and there is a reasonably good fit. Not perfect, but reasonably good fit probably within our accuracy to what we see experimentally, despite the fact that here we have only monolayer of water inside our capillaries. We can't define meniscus or contact angles or whatever inside those capillaries and still one, one layer of water you can there is no sense of uh, meniscus in this case and still this work in first approximation we understand what's going on in first approximation you can rewrite this equation in terms of interaction of water molecules in vapor form or liquid form with the surfaces and uh, instead of using macroscopic quantities of surface tension and so on. So as, uh, uh, as long as you don't have confinement, water molecules interact the same way. Either it's a big channel or small channel, uh, doesn't matter. As long as uh, density doesn't change, those molecules just fill the surface only if they are near the surface and it doesn't change. But in our situation, especially here, when we have only one layer or few layers of water, many things change. One is uh, uh, density of water changes, but most importantly, this interaction of water with surfaces depends on uh, the structure of water outside. So, uh, if we take it into account, as we did in our molecular dynamic situation, we have to expect a huge oscillations in 
uh, humidity at which condensation occur. This is unfavorable stay, stay to condense. Water won't condense at some, at some certain, certain thicknesses of our capillaries. So we couldn't understand for a long time what's going on uh, until we realized that we deal with flexible confinement. We should deal not only with the water itself, but the fact that there could be elastic deformation. And it's not only for our case, but for the case of uh, any capillaries, even in bulk capillaries, when you get negative capillary pressure, which tries to deform those walls uh, at thousand bars, it's pretty large force, then you can easily gain flexibility of the order of half angstrom, and this would be enough to push from this maxima into one of those minima of the system. So when we model this, taking into account the final flexibility, we get uh, pretty good agreement. We don't have enough resolution to see all those slightly uh, oscillatory remaining behavior, but this is what we observed, and we did it on other kind of channels as well, and more or less understand uh, now capillary condensation and this atomic scale confinement. So the message to take from this uh, condensation experiments that indeed, to a very big surprise, at least for me and some of my colleagues, we still can use macroscopic Kelvin equation to describe only qualitatively, but it's uh, good enough all those condensation phenomena which usually happens under ambient conditions and uh, what we observed in the world. Uh, around us, uh, but uh, some details uh, matter, and those details remain to be investigated. So, uh, message to take away, I hope I persuaded you that this Angstrom scale, atomic scale, two-dimensional channels are pretty interesting new experimental system. Physics comes uh, due to reduced dimensionality and you can uh, also address problems which were not addressable before by any other previous means. Thank you very much for your attention. My last slide is to acknowledge brilliant postdocs and uh, collaborators which contributed into this work, and many of those are professors in, in different countries these days. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Andrea, for a very, very interesting talk. Uh, it's so great to see the empty space to uh, utilizing that to you know study so many inter interesting scientific topics. So let me start by asking you the first questions. You know, during my talk, your talk, I was thinking, uh, you know, this tiny empty space allow you to change the interaction. Um, and uh, one question is related to maybe you are already doing experiment on that is. Uh, I'm thinking going from water to ice, anything you will expect interesting happen, for example, uh, maybe you are doing it with the melting pot of the, of the ice change a lot like freezing pot. And uh, uh, with the, all the molecular order, you generate different type of ice structure, any speculation on that? Uh, yeah, that's... Uh... Extremely interesting question, and we thought about this a lot. And people have done a lot of molecular dynamic uh, simulations in this case. Uh, the problem is, it's not really clear how to uh, define what is ice, when, what is liquid water when you go to uh, to uh, two dimensions, okay. Arguably, we already observed uh, two-dimensional ice uh, under pressure in those capillaries. There is a way to do this, but uh, this is kind of because uh, 2D is a relatively unstable system in terms of flux situations. You can say costarlitz towelist transition plays a lot of role. The difference between ice 
and water it's kind of a murky area because you can imagine your ice is so unstable it's com constantly changes its structure all the time so as far as i know no one has defined any uh transition from liquid water to ice in 2d and how it's to define and whether there is this transition at all rather this is kind of a glassy transition it's not known as far as i'm aware of yeah so so andre another question is uh, so you talk about a lot about waters so what about other solvent uh uh, oh. similar phenomena that is uh, capillary condensation maybe like uh, in the lithium ion system or silver capacitor oftentimes organic solvent is used right the the ion solvation shell have you get chance to look into those systems yet it's only four years old since uh, <laughs> the first paper was and uh, i have two hands with the help of my collaborators we we probably have uh, whatever uh 12 hands and so and so, and so on but uh um yeah it's uh it's an interesting to expand this area into different directions but uh we need uh, help from uh from other people abroad who might find uh uh, uh, uh some interesting uh, problems to address with this kind of experimental setup yeah we're looking forward for there is a lot of theory initiated by our experiments but only a couple of groups experimentally in singapore and in paris paris uh, who uh, uh, are currently working on this system and it's a very big area yeah so um maybe one last question andrew um yeah. So what is the, this is from the uh, audience. What is the meaning of 2D water? Is the two hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atoms are in the same plane? I guess what this audience means, you have this 2D empty space, are this molecule lying down, you know, forming the planar structure? I think the best, uh, the best way is to look at this, at this picture. Unfortunately, I don't have an image here from view from the top. But in this case, okay, we routinely can uh, deal with the systems and study properties when there is only a monolayer of water. This is the same definition like for 2D materials, uh, a monolayer or few layers of water present, present here, and the structure is, uh, is uh, different from the bulk water. If I would have picture of looking from the top, you would see here kind of crystal, uh, a little bit like square eyes, a little bit thromboic structure, but uh, could be in the first approximation, square eyes would be there. That's, uh, that's very similar to any other 2D, 2D material. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrea. You are going to be interested, I think later you are going to see Professor Omar Yagi's talk. Well, it's not by design, but somehow he will also talk about empty space, but in a <laughs> in a very chemistry system. I'm looking forward. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Andrew Gam. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Judy Cha. Judy is associate professor of mechanical engineering and material science at Yale University. She received her PhD from Cornell University and did her postdoc here at Stanford. Uh, he has been pioneering the synthesis of topological nanomaterials in the past decade. Uh, she has done many, many nice uh, research works. Uh, she has won many awards. She has been recognized with the Gordon Moore and Betty Moore. Uh, these uh, this quantum material synthesis program, I think, uh, called EPIQS Synthesis Investigator Award and, and NSF Career Award. Um, he also is won the IBM Faculty Award. With that, I will hand this over to Judy. Okay, thank you, Yi, for the introduction. Um, Yi, can you tell me if this is in presentation mode? Uh, uh, no, this is not. Yeah. 
you need it's to present. Yeah. Okay, so let me. Okay, so this is in presentation mode now. It's okay, correct. Chris. Okay, uh, so thanks for. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of Nano Letters to uh, for this opportunity to present some of our work uh, that I studied at Yale. Uh, Knowing that uh, Professor Gaim was going to talk mostly about 2D materials, I wanted to move away from that. So I'm, I'm going to today talk about uh, topological nanowires. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart, which I started 10 years ago uh, while working as a postdoc in e E3's group, actually, at Stanford. So the background here is nanowires of tin telluride. Uh, tin telluride is a topological material. And today I'll uh, share with you some recent results on those fronts. So for those of you in the audience who may not uh, study topological materials, uh, for material scientists and people who are uh, interested in the properties, we can just consider this as a regular bulk materials, but with a special surface properties. So for topological insulators, it's a bulk insulator or bulk semiconductor, um, as denoted by these shaded areas in band structures, but with uh, surface topologically protected surface states, which are denoted in these two lines. Special thing about these two surface states is that the spin of the electrons are locked to the directions of the electron motions. Um, we know this is true, uh, and then uh, a lot of ARPES measurements, angle resolve photoelectron spectroscopy, directly image the band structures and really prove the existence of these surface states. Pictorially, you can imagine it to be having these. Uh, electrons living on the surface uh, that transport. Um, 10 years ago, we thought it's just a few classes of materials that have these special properties, but now we think that up to a quarter, quarter of all the materials or compounds that we know perhaps are topological. Um, here is a subset of topological materials made into nanostructures. Um, so uh, earlier on was the bismuth selenide and telluride nano ribbons and plates, uh, which we made um, working in East Group at Stanford. So these are the early topological insulator nanostructures. Uh, moving to uh, the transition metal dichalcogenides, such as molly telluride and tungsten telluride, you can have them in monolayers and have their uh, topological metallic state that come out. Here is the whale semimetal cadmium arsenide um, and a whole lot of uh, different compounds that can be made into nanostructures. And it makes sense to want to make these topological materials into nanostructures because what we care about is their surface properties. So as you make it into nanostructures, your surface properties will be enhanced. Um, I think there's one killer application that really um, advocates for nanowires. Um, in nanowires, uh, the, the, one, the one application is the um, opportunity to make Majorana bound states at the ends of the nanowires. And the application of this would be robust quantum computers that do not require uh, error corrections, right? That do not suffer from decoherence problems that really is the challenge for existing quantum bits. Um, so the first theoretical framework demonstrating how Majorana bound states can be uh, supported in these systems is by the, the Sarmas group at Maryland. Here, this gray nanowire is a semiconducting nanowire with a spin or recoupling effect, and you make them superconducting by putting aluminum leads. And from this, uh, Jason, Alisa, Alicia, and Matthew Fisher then come up with how to make and manipulate, move, and braid Majorana fermions. So these red balls schematically shown are the Majorana bound states. You can move them around. If you have a junction, you can then braid them. And th that would be the basis for quantum computing. And following after that, the first experimental attempt to do this was by uh, Leo Kovanovan's group at Delft using indium and timonite nanowires, um, MB grown, and putting aluminum superconductors. So I think the key premise is making one dimensional, so nanowires of topological superconductors and trying to really realize these Majorana bound states for quantum computations. Um, as somebody who works in this field, I'll be the first to want to say that there are a lot of challenges. Um, one is that unless you're using sophisticated growth uh, methods such as MBE, uh, we still don't have good control on the uh, crystalline quality 
morphology and dimensions of these nanowires. We need to make sure that we're making nanowire, many nanowires of the same diameters and the length. So that's one problem. Second is that um, it's much harder to go from synthesis of the nanowires to checking their electrical properties because the device fabrication is involved. Um, so the feedback from the synthesis to property takes much longer time. And one of the challenges here particularly is surface oxidation, right? So we wanna make nanostructures because we wanna enhance the properties of surface. However, nanostructure means that surface oxidation is also much more pronounced, unlike in bulk crystals. So we have to take care of the surface oxidation problem, which is responsible for degrading the transfer properties. Um, but these are not insurmountable problems. So for, for example, the first demonstration of perhaps there's a topological surface electrons living on um, uh, topological material was the bismuth solenite nanoribbons. So these wiggles, these wiggles are in the resistance measurements at low temperature. And these wiggles tell you something about the topological surface electrons. Uh, this nanoribbon was not protected from environmental oxidation. Uh, after this, uh, we then, uh, this is from E3's group at Stanford, uh, when we coated these bismuth solenite nanoribbons with selenium to try to prevent the surface oxidation, you see that the wiggles are much more pronounced and they extend out to much higher magnetic field and they survive up to much higher temperature. So, the, uh, so I believe that topological nanostructures indeed have all the properties that theory predicts and that as long as we uh, take care of surface oxidation, this is a very promising platform. Um, so even for the first demonstration using the indium antimonide uh, nanowires, which was the semiconducting nanowires with our spring coupling, the first uh, device was putting just aluminum leads. But, now, uh, but then after that, they now make a core shell nanowire, right? So the core is the semiconducting wire with spin couple orbit um, effect. And now they surround it with uh, superconducting aluminum with an epitaxial uh, epitaxy right at the interface. Um, and with this, the most um, recent study is done by Charlie Marker's group uh, in University of Copenhagen, where they indeed revisited the Majorana bound states problem, but now in this core shell uh, structure. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about my own uh, studies. Um, it'll be on two systems. One is tin telluride nanowires, and the one, the other one is fairly recent, which is on molyphosphide nanowires. Um, my group just uses a chemical vapor deposition method uh, to make these nanowires, so metal, metal catalyzed CVD. So we just decorate our substrates, usually with gold nanoparticles, um, have a source and dopant source powder, or sometimes gas, um, and then if, uh, as the source powder uh, evaporate and uh, come down to the substrate, they condense and recrystallize as nanostructures. Uh, this is a pretty easy and fast method to make a variety of nanostructures. These are subset of topological materials made into ribbons and wires and plates. Uh, for tin telluride, uh, this is topological crystalline insulator. Um, this is a rock salt crystal structure with a tin and tellurium. Uh, it has many surface states, many uh, direct dispersive surface states on many different crystalline planes. So here on 111, you have a set of uh, direct cones in 001, and also in 110, you have set of direct cones. So Yoichi Ando's group and Liang Fu's group first predicted this class of materials back in 2011-ish. Um, here is a calculation. The blue is for the bulk states, and then the red is the surface states. So you see uh, the direct, the linear dispersion here. And D is the uh, measured band structure, image band structure that shows this linear dispersion. So we can make them into nanoplates, nanowires, um, and then we then measure their electrical property. Um, if you just make them and then uh, measure their carrier densities, what you find is that they're uh, heavily doped. So it's supposed to be um, narrow gap semiconductors with the surface states. So if it's perfect crystal, the carrier density should be small. However, when you make a whole bar measurement, uh, the carrier density range is between 10 to the 20 to 22. So this is heavily, heavily doped P-type semiconductor. And this mostly comes from tin vacancies. It's very shallow uh, defect sites, so it's easy to make tin vacancies. 
Um, trying to reduce teen vacancies is challenging, uh, although it can, it's not impossible. Uh, one way we try to reduce the carrier density was by making anion doping, so mixing the selenium and tellurium together. This actually works and we can effectively reduce the carrier density. However, tin selenide is actually not a cubic structure, so if you, if you put a lot of selenium, your crystal structure will change, which means that some of the topological surface states will be lost. Um, another method to try is to dope it with indium. So if you actually dope it with indium, the carrier density does not decrease. But you can freeze the bulk electrons because there's enough disorder that the uh, mobility of the bulk electrons become very low. The real reason for doping with indium is for the superconductivity, right? Because the indium doped in telluride is a candidate material for topological superconductor. So there are lots of bulk studies that show if you dope it with indium, tin telluride superconduct, and that the TC increases quite a bit. So here is uh, Yoichi Ando's uh, bulk study that shows how the TC, the superconducting uh, transition temperature, increases as your indium dopant increases. Uh, okay. Um, so we then uh, dope our nanostructures with indium. So here is just the one plate where you can see a little bit of indium in the EDX spectrum. The crystal structure is the cubic rock salt phase as we expected. Um, and now as we gradually increase the indium dopant from 0%, so this is just in, uh, tin telluride uh, nanoplate, um, as we increase the indium up to 10%, you can see the onset of superconductivity that emerge at around 4 to 5% indium doping. So this is the resistance as a function of temperature, and you can see a sudden drop of resistivity here. Uh, here, uh, now we are uh, scaling all the way down to about 0.4 Kelvin. So for the nanoplate, indium doped tin telluride nanoplate, you can see that the superconducting transition is relatively sharp. Um, and then the resistance is zero for uh, a window of temperature. Uh, and then it creeps back up, which we're still, uh, uh, we need to investigate. Um, here is a nano ribbon. Uh, uh, my definition of what's nano plate and nano ribbon nanowires are pretty loosely defined. Um, you can see the transition now, the superconducting transition is much more broad. Um, in fact, there are two uh, transitions that are happening. And now here's nanowires where the width of the wire is about 300 nanometers and below. So superconductivity is still retained, although the transition is now much more broader. Uh, but the material is pretty good. Um, so we then uh, worked with uh, uh, Jimmy Williams at Maryland who measured a Josephson junction measurement. So these are uh, tin telluride wires and he's putting the aluminum leads, much the same way as the initial indium and timonide work by uh, Leo Coven Evans group and Liang Fu at MIT has provided theory for this. Um, this is really his Jimmy study, so I would um, 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 I would recommend uh, if you're interested uh, to look at this archive paper. A key key point is that if you look at the sort of critical current, so meaning when you flow a high enough current, the superconductivity gets suppressed. So what is the maximum current that superconductivity still retained? That's the critical current. If you look at the critical current, the critical current on the negative side and the positive side is different, and that's very odd. Uh, you wouldn't expect that for regular junctions in overdamped regions. And another thing that I like a lot is that if you apply a magnetic field, if you apply a magnetic field and then you do similar measurements, you find that your critical current is not, is not maximum at zero magnetic field. So, you know, superconductor, superconductivity gets suppressed with magnetic field. Um, so here, what we're seeing is the opposite. And that is, at a finite magnetic field, superconductivity actually gets enhanced. And at zero magnetic field, superconductivity is not the strongest at, at, at zero magnetic field. So that's really interesting. Um, the, the upshot of it all is that uh, we think that we're observing superconductivity with broken time reversal symmetry. So please, um, if you're shocked by that statement, uh, go, please go take a read at this uh, manuscript. As a material scientist, and especially as somebody who makes these nanowires, 
What I found most interesting is the fact that the, um, the magnetic diffraction pattern that Jimmy measured was sensitive to the diameter of the tin telluride nanowire. So A is 160 nanometers and F is 450 nanometers, gradually increasing. Um, the model that uh, Yang Fu developed requires interactions between multiple surface bands of tin telluride. And it, it requires that the, the size of the bands at the Fermi level be different. Um, how do you microscopically realize this? One potential, one possible way is ferroelectric domain. So tin telluride, when you cool it, it goes through a structural transition from cubic to distorted rhombohedral. And you can see that by a kink in the resistivity measurements here. And you will then have lots of ferroelectric domains. And at the domain walls, we think, um, we can enhance the electron scattering or the interactions between the bands. Um, so another benefit of making nanostructures is that if they're tiny enough that you can put them in, in, inside a transition electron microscope and characterize the full structure, right? So then the task here is to prove a, the structural uh, transition happens, which so far people just look at it with either scattering measurements or uh, resistivity kink. And two, directly verify ferroelectric domain walls and measure the type, uh, look at the type and density of the domain walls. So we worked with uh, Ime Zeus and Myung Gun Han at Brookhaven National Lab and cooled our tin telluride nanowires inside TM. So at room temperature, you just see a wire. Um, at 12 Kelvin, we noticed that there are these dark bands that emerge in these nanowires, which were absent at room temperature. And these are not uh, band contours because the wires are uh, bending. In terms of measuring a diffraction pattern, at room temperature, it's a cubic crystal as we would expect, and each, each diffraction spot is just a single spot. At low temperature, some of these single spots split into two spots. So here, this, uh, this uh, one is now magnified, and you can see that there are two spots. So that means that there are two crystallographic orientations present in these nanowires at room temperature. So we think that that actually matches with two ferroelectric uh, domains that are tilted by about a degree. Okay? And so we think that this indicates the structural transition which is associated with the ferroelectric uh, 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 properties. And here I'm going to play an uh, in-situ movie where we were tracking this wire as we were warming it up. And you can see all these dark bands suddenly disappearing at 80 Kelvin, uh, really indicating a phase transition. OK. OK, so right at 80 Kelvin, you see all these uh, bands disappear. I think what's really fascinating about this movie also is the fact that all the intensity variations that you see that extend over a wide range of temperature indicate the mechanical strains that the system is undergoing. And that that actually has implications for the transfer properties and also the phase transition pathways. And I think that uh, studying in situ work like this in real space um, will provide a lot of information that's necessary to understand these phase transitions in detail. Um, here's another wire, uh, a, di a different entire nanowire, again showing these dark bands. Um, and we understand what the uh, ferroelectric domain walls uh, are possible in these tin telluride nanowires. And our simulation reproduced the uh, experimental results. Um, at the beginning, I talked about the challenges of nanomaterials, and there's a lot of synthesis uh, improvement that must be made. Uh, over this last seven years, as I was working on tin telluride, there were a couple of synthesis improvements that we made. So I'm going to tell you one a uh, couple. So the first is that actually, if we do a just natural cool down after CBD, there are a lot of surface defects that you'll make, and that's due to actually thermal etching. And this actually reflects the fact that there are a lot of dislocations embedded in our nanostructure. So even though the nanostructures themselves are not epitaxial growth from the substrate, um, because the growth happens rather fast, there can be quite a bit of dislocations embedded in it. Um, so when we do fast cooling, at least we uh, remove the thermal etching step so that the surface can be smooth. Um, dis dislocations are still inside, 
but we can remove the surface roughness. Second was we moved away from using gold nanoparticles as our catalyst to the gold tin alloys, and that really helped making the wires narrow. Um, what's most exciting is that uh, Jan Schurz, who's a colleague in Yale, uh, serendipitously discovered that you can just mold crystalline metals into wires. Um, and that because they're so small, you do not make dislocations or grain boundaries uh, at such small nanoscales. So, and then we demonstrated that that's true for tin telluride. So here is tin telluride nanowires just being pushed against the mold, um, filling all these nanoscale channels. And what we find is that there are single crystal nanowires. So this, I think, is really exciting. And there's a lot of implications for many quantum materials into large scale fabrication of nanowires. Um, I think my time is probably up. Um, let me just briefly talk about molyphosphide a bit. Molyphosphide is another topological metal. Um, one attribute is that its conductivity is extremely high. So in other words, resistance is extremely low. So we want to explore if it can be potentially used to replace copper interconnects. Um, so here is the uh, recent data. We make these molyphosphide wires. They're polycrystalline, but you can see that um, the black dots are the resistivity. The, the red is resistance. So now that we know cross sections, we can convert it to resistivity. So down to about 1,000 nanometer square cross section area, the resistivity is similar to bulk molyphosphide. Um, so if you compare this to where copper is, it's not so bad. So we're excited about uh, pushing this further down. So, oops, I was going back. That's it. Um, so the takeaway take message would be nanowires of topological materials, especially topological superconductors, I think is important. Um, there are challenges with this, but I think they can be overcome. One immediate challenge everyone should really think about is the surface oxidation and how to prevent that. Um, and um, this work was actually done by two previous postdocs, uh, Dr. Shen, who's now at IOP as a professor, and Dr. Ku uh, Piran Kumadavir, Piran Kumadavadil, sorry, Piran, uh, who's actually in uh, Professor Gaim's group. And uh, Pengzi is a senior grad student, and then uh, uh, postdoc uh, Hyuk Jin Han. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Judy, for all these uh, very interesting materials on topological, <coughs> with topological quantum phenomenon. Uh, first question, Judy, uh, surface is so important uh, for these materials. So what's the, currently, what's the most efficient method to preserve the surface? Uh, you know, a dec about a decade ago, the selenium coating as one example is demonstrated by several groups. Uh, what about now? What will be the most uh, effective approach to preserve the surface? So people who do MBE growth, um, they, they now, they can do core shell. Actually, people who do CVD growth can also do core shell. But people who do MBE, I think um, they can then, uh, Okay, so epitaxial core shell will be the most effective. And for indium and timonite, that's what they're now doing, right? Coating it with aluminum as a shell material. For CVD growth, especially if it's uh, chalcogenide materials, right? Selenite, tellurides, you can do the overcoating with the amorphous selenium or tellurium layer. And that is actually really effective. Um, so, you know, all the uh, thin film people, when they send samples to get the RPS done, they would do the amorphous selenium or tellurium coating. I think that is still very effective uh, method, right? Um, when it's other things like arsenic or phosphide, um, then I don't have an answer for those ones yet. Uh, for the molyphosphide, so far we have not done any uh, protection layer. Yet our resistance is pretty good, comparable to the bulk. So um, we'll we'll just push without doing much, um, and later we'll have to think about something else. Um, you know, if you connect uh, your growth with another chamber, right, so that you do your growth and then send it to the another chamber to do the coding, ALD coding. That's simple, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
So second question, you show this very interesting thermomechanical uh, formation <laughs> of a single crystal nanowire, very small one with your colleague. Uh, is that a melting process? You melt this material, you push that into a or template. What, what, what's this molding process like? So the this is this happens at about half of the melting temperature of the bulk. Okay, so so there is of course Gibson Gibbs Thompson effect, and the melting temperature will decrease at nanoscale. But we still think that this is solid diffusion, right? Um, so it's it it is a solid diffusion mechanism. Um, you're Atoms are flowing into the empty pores. So the pressure at the entrance is pretty low. And then the atoms just diffuse in a solid state. That's our, and then if you do scaling experiments, you know, you, you look at how far can you, how long the wires are as a function of the pressure, nanowire diameter and all that. Um, it follows the scaling laws of solid diffusion, not liquid flow. So, I mean, looking at, uh... Professor Andrew Gunn's previous talk <laughs> about this very small empty space, the capillary condensation, of course, that's liquid. Uh, but now in this very small channel, if you give it mechanical pressure, this material is kind of well, a liquid state called wetting uh, happening. Would, would that help driving the diffusion going in as well, the surface AAO, surface bonding with the, your materials, then that really helped this whole, I'm just thinking out loud to, to pick right. up a little bit. So, um, so right now the scale is about down to about 30 to, 49, 30 to 40 nanometer in diameter as a pore size. So it's, uh, uh, it's about 10 times bigger than uh, what uh, Professor Andre Gein talked about in terms of the length scale. Um, we've also done, not us, but previous postdoc in Jan's group also did the, this process on gold at liquid nitrogen temperature. So I think that it's highly unlikely there's any liquid phase during the process. Okay. Yeah. Well, Judy, th thank you very much. We'll uh, come back to have a uh, more discussion during panel, okay? Let, let's move on to the uh, next presentation by Professor Omar Yagi. Let me introduce Omar a little bit. Uh, Pro Omar is a professor in, of chemistry at, at UC Berkeley. He's the funding director of Berkeley Global Science Institute. Uh, he's also a co-director of Cavalry Energy Nanoscience Institute, as well as the uh, California Research Alliance funded by uh, BASF. Uh, Omar, I consider Omar as a Mr. Frameworks. He really started the field of metal organic framework, you know, covalent organic framework, or zeolithic uh, immortal solid framework, right? I call him Mr. Framework. Uh, he will use different terms, scientific terms to describe it. His uh, achievement has been recognized by numerous awards. Let me mention a few. He's the winner of Wolf Prize in chemistry in 2018. He, he's the winner of uh, MIS medal in 2007. And uh, he's a member of National, US National Academy of Sciences. With that, Omar, uh, please uh, take over the podium. Uh, you are on mute, Omar. Thank you, E, and uh, thank you all for uh, organizing this um, on behalf of Nano Letters. Um, today, I want to introduce you to reticular chemistry and then show you one of the applications among many for this chemistry in harvesting water from desert air. So, um, you know, chemists are very much used to dealing with atoms and molecules, and we've developed ways of precisely designing them, but in terms of linking molecules to make extended structures and materials, this precision has not really been done until the advent of reticular chemistry, which I define as the chemistry of linking molecular building blocks through strong bonds to make crystalline extended structures. This definition has three very important and new components in chemistry. The first one is linking things by molecular building blocks, implies that we will ultimately want to design we want to link them through strong bonds to make robust materials so that if you want to use them for water harvesting, they will operate day after day, month after month, year after year, without having to change them. 
and replenish them. So strong bonds are a very important component of reticular chemistry, and we aim to make crystalline extended structures. In practice, this is one of the biggest development in chemistry today, is that you can link molecular building blocks by strong bonds, and at the same time, we've developed methods to making them in crystal as crystals, which means that they are well-defined on the atomic and molecular level. And that if you have a porous materials uh, material, that the pores are homogeneous throughout the crystal and throughout the material. So the result of reticular chemistry has been designing metal organic frameworks from metal oxide units and organic units reticulated to make extended, in this case, three-dimensional structure. The yellow ball here indicates the space within which molecules and gases can, uh, can occupy the pores. This is obviously a fragment of the extended structure. We've also made covalent organic frameworks. These are entirely made from organic molecules linked to covalent bonds. And if you wonder with all the strong bonds and rigidity of these frameworks, how do we get flexibility? We've invented recently molecular weaving to show that in fact, covalent uh, threads could be interlaced. You can see them here in red and blue, interlaced in and out of each other so that you have a woven molecular fabric that is capable not just of porosity and all the things that you want in a, in a material in terms of functionalization, but also of flexibility. So I will not discuss this today, but certainly I will talk a little bit about MOFs and COFs before I get to water harvesting application. At the urgent uh, request of E, he asked me to give a, a, a little history about MOFs, what is the origin of MOFs. And um, I would say the first metal organic structures were crystallized back in 1959. And they were made from neutral linkers. This is gonna be very important linked by uh, metal ions. This linkage is not so strong. This is a neutral uh, nitrogen, a Lewis base linked to copper one to make an extended structure. And this strategy has been utilized over and over again by uh, chemists until 1995. When we uh, basically tried to use these frameworks for various purposes like exchanging the iron, trying to explore their porosity. And we found that they collapse upon removal of the solvent that fills the pores. We found that they're not designable because the vertices or the nodes are made from single metal ions. And as you know, metal ions could, in this case, copper one could be tetrahedral or trigonal, so very difficult to design. And they were not chemically stable because they are made from weak metal nitrogen uh, interactions, neutral ligands such as pyridine and nitrile. So there was a problem here that we addressed by basically taking charged linkers like carboxylates and binding them to metal ions. Because of the charge on the linker, now this interaction is much stronger. It's even as strong as a covalent bond uh, that one uses, let's say, in organic chemistry. So this was the first time back in 1995 that one could crystallize an organic linker like trimesic acid with a metal ion. So we showed that these can be made and crystallized and characterized by single crystal X-ray diffraction. Then because of the carboxylate, we very quickly realized that to address the node flexibility issue, one can use the carboxylate to aggregate metals so that you have what we called secondary building units. These are basically clusters. You can call them polynuclear metal oxide units or secondary building units, and they are rigid. And so you see the carboxylates here uh, binding two zinc ions through these strong bonds to make rigid nodes that they are then linked to make a grid, an extended 2D, 2D grid. So this was the very first, I would say, intellectual departure from the traditional coordination uh, polymers. And this did the trick in that um, the material that I just described, when we make it, it's filled with 
DMF molecules because of the way it is made. It's made in DMF with base to deprotonate the acid and then crystallized. So this, um, these conditions are sort of magical conditions that we have come up with that are being used until today to make, to make MOFs. So to prove that in fact, these frameworks are open, they have permanent porosity and they do not collapse like the coordination polymers. We measured the gas absorption isotherm at 77 Kelvin to show that you have nitrogen uptake and nitrogen release from the pores without distorting the pores. This type one shaped isotherm indicates that the pores remain open in the absence of guests. And that really is the gold standard for measuring porosity. So this was the very first proof of permanent porosity in a metal organic structure. And this set off the field uh, to a, an, an amazing direction in that now with the ability to make clusters like I just described, SBUs, one can use now tetrazinc oxide units to link them up to make primitive cubic structures. This is called Ma5. And this, is, this structure was shown to be extremely porous. And here again, you see the type one isotherm with 61% of the framework being open and available for binding of other molecules. The surface area is quite high and at the time broke all records of porosity, only to be broken later by other MOFs that we have made in, in years to come. Now, another very important principle that we discovered very early on is that once you know the conditions under which these clusters form, in this case, tetrazinc units, one can employ uh, functionalized linkers or expanded linkers and thereby crafting the interior, taking this molecular space and crafting it for various applications, changing its chemical composition and its physical characteristics so that you can tailor make the pores for various applications. Also, by using longer linker, one is able to make progressively larger and larger pores within which one can bind progressively larger and larger molecules. In fact, we made things with pore sizes up to 100 angstroms into which we showed that proteins can actually go into the, into the pores. So, so what the principles of MOF chemistry then, that, that really the foundation was laid back in 1999, uh, 95 to 1999, is the strong bond approach gives you robust structures, open structure, architecture robust. The SBU approach is absolutely necessary to designing these and using the SBUs as anchors. The synthetic methodology, the ability to uh, really lay out the conditions under which to crystallize these and make them in, in as well-defined materials. And then of course, the measurement of the low pressure, low temperature isotherm, which is the gold standard for proving porosity. These four things define what is being commonly used today to study moth, uh, moths and characterize uh, moths. So you can see that um, the, the field has moved beyond those clusters that I just showed you. And you can use many different clusters as SBUs in MOFs, even rod-shaped SBUs. And I'd like you to keep in mind this rod-shaped SBU because it is, it's been the key to making the water harvesting uh, materials. And I will discuss that later, but almost every metal in the periodic table could be used and almost every cluster known in inorganic chemistry could be used as a um, as a building unit. Same thing for organics, simple chiral organics could be used and quite uh, complex ones could be used as linkers to make very large, very large pores. And the variety of them that one can, you know, if you can think it basically, you can make a moth out of it. So, so there are many different ways of making MOFs using uh, organic, variously shaped 
uh, organic building units. And so it becomes more of a geometry uh, uh, exercise. What structures are you going to make by combining one shape with another, the SBU with an organic linker? And, and so we have identified all the most likely structures that could result. And the ones you see here filled are the ones that have been made with MOFs. And some of them, uh, many different topologies could be, could be made. But you can see here that in this chemistry, we are able to cover many different shapes, including not just the ones that I just uh, showed on the previous slide, but also hexagons, octagons, or octahedra, and uh, trigonal prismatic, and so on. They, uh, with increasing complexity, all of these have been made as MOFs. Now you see some open, uh, open squares, and that, that means that these are still yet to be made combination, and still there's a lot of potential for other uh, uh, structures, uh, MOF structures to be, to be uh, synthesized. But my point is that the SBU approach and the availability of variously shaped secondary building units and organic units, plus our ability to also functionalize those building units um, and targeting millions of different frameworks really uh, has led to identification of hundreds of applications thus far. And this leads to infinite chemistry. So it's really infinite chemistry generating infinite number of materials. And it looks like really nearly infinite number of applications. And just listening to Professor Andre Geim, uh, many opportunities for doing uh, uh, really cool physics on, on these materials. So that's, that's the MOF field. Now I want to turn into the COF field. Um, there, there, there was nothing known in 2D and 3D. And this is uh, really articulated very nicely by Roald Hoffman in this article in Scientific American, published back in 1993. He wrote, organic chemists are masterful at exercising control in zero dimension. One subculture of organic chemists has learned to exercise control in one dimension. These are polymer chemists, the chain builders. But in two or three dimension, it is a synthetic wasteland. And that's about the time I started as an assistant professor, except I discovered this article years much, much later. But anyway, that fell really in, in um, that articulates uh, the state of the field back uh, in, in the early 90s. Well, it's no surprise if you try to link organic molecules through covalent bonds to make extended structures, this is what the student will get. They'll get a broad amorphous basically amorphous material. And so, so this is a, a challenge that we had to overcome, but fi by finding the right conditions and the right reactions under which to crystallize these. And these turned out to be really the magic conditions for coughs. Um, with slight modification, all coughs being made today are made using this type of, of reaction, utilizing mesetylene dioxane at heating it to around 100 degrees, in this case, 120 degrees for a few days. And what you're doing here is you're taking a unit like this, diboronic acid, and you're condensing water out. And since water is a byproduct, you can play with the pressure of water in the vessel to um, reverse the formation of this as the material is crystallizing and therefore correct the, 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 uh, the, the, the faults and ultimately make nice crystalline material. So this reversibility is controlled by controlling the pressure of water in this, in this vessel. So that was really the key development. And this was uh, the, the uh, synthesis of the first cough back in 2005. And we showed that, and with coughs, it's nice because you can predict the structure. Uh, this is the, the X-ray powder diffraction. And in this case, uh, this is a calculated X-ray powder diffraction. This is the experimental X-ray powder diffraction. And we use various spectroscopies to make sure that we know that uh, the linkage has formed and the right bonds are, are forming. This is the structure of COF-1. It's a slipped graphitic 
type structures, a 2D uh, extended structure. There's been a lot of studies at, at cleaving this and making a 2D single layer, single layer material. But it's porous and it's functionalizable. You can do all kind of organic chemistry on these uh, phenylene units and decorate the pores and do everything that reticular chemistry offers in terms of precision modification of these structures. Why? Because they are uh, made of covalent bonds. So now you can do covalent organic reactions on them without destroying their structure and, and maintaining their crystallinity. That's very important. So um, that was 2D. In 3D, use the same conditions, but heating a little less and combining these two building units to make an extended structure. This turns out to be extremely crystalline structure under those conditions. And uh, the lightest material known to date, I guess, at room temperature after lithium. So it's, uh, the, this structure is entirely composed of boron, oxygen, and carbon, hydrogen on the carbon, and that is linked covalently throughout. So the challenge that Roald Hoffman was talking about, the synthetic wasteland, now you can see that in 2005, we crystallized 2D structures. In 2007, we crystallized the 3D, the 3D structures. Well, the ultimate, of course, is to crystallize carbon-carbon bonds. And so now you see how we use slightly different conditions, now adding trifluoroacetic acid. Then the trifluoroacetic acid is sort of a modulator that allows us to reverse this reaction during its formation and make crystals. See, it's fairly crystalline material. And this is a slipped graphitic structure, which we can uh, refine from the, from the powder diffraction. But see, it's entirely linked by extremely strong bonds, CN double bonds and CC bonds, CC double bonds. This is an extended 2D structure. Again, it's crystalline. It can be modified and still without losing its crystallinity. And it is very stable. And uh, you can see here, this is the original MOF. This is the MOF, uh, so excuse me, the original cough. This is the cough in 12 molar hydrochloric acid and saturated KOH. Um, no change in the X-ray powder diffraction. Even in n lithium, this is really a robust material. It's almost as if you've taken graphite or a graphite layer and drilled holes in it, and now you can functionalize it, except that in the cough, we know exactly where each atom is and how it is connected. And we can carry out the precision organic chemistry that we do in molecules, we do it on the solid. So the way uh, cough chemistry works really is a, is, is a new thing for chemists in that you imagine what framework you want to make, in this case, a square grid or a Kagome type lattice. And conceptually, you break it down into its components. You look at the angles that you need for the molecules that would replace these components to make the material. And you find them, or you make them, you put them together, you simulate the crystal structure, and then you go to the lab and make it. And these are, this is exactly how uh, cough chemistry works. And without, without being able to predict the structure, one cannot solve the uh, crystal structures of coughs. You really have to have predicted that structure. And this is, as you see here, things will fit together very nicely. In this case, the angles are uh, 90 degrees, in this case, they are 60 degrees and 120 degrees, and they fit together exactly how one would predict. Well, it's no surprise that reticular chemistry, since our first paper in 1995 with MOFs, I, I was started my career at Arizona State University, uh, one country, two publications, and now the whole field has um, been widely adopted um, uh, in the world, well, now it's 102 countries and 27,524 publications as of um, a few months ago in 2020. So, so the field, so, so really what, the reason it's exciting is 
because we can design materials. We have combined organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry to make, to move away, to move beyond the atom and the molecule to make frameworks, but using really basic organic and inorganic chemistry to make frameworks. And these frameworks encompass space within which one can do a lot. Um, catalysis, or as we have started a few years ago with gas adsorption, storage of hydrogen, storage of methane for automobiles, uh, capture of carbon dioxide. And I won't talk about these today. There's a lot of work that we've done on these three areas. Today, I wanna to focus on in the time remaining on water. Well, uh, the red regions that you see here, the red and orange regions are all uh, arid regions of the world. And uh, most of the year, um, these uh, uh, people who live in these areas experience water stress. In fact, one third of the world population lives in water stress regions. And questions of water purity arise in most of the world, including in the industrialized world. Flint, Michigan, for example, is, is, a, is, a, is a prominent uh, example of that. And, uh, and there's also a lot of um, national security or, or um, uh, issues with uh, 160 countries import their water. They rely on other countries for their water. So this, this is, uh, water is one of the most pressing problems facing the world today. And it will be, according to the UN, in the, by the year 2005, almost 5 billion people living on our planet will be experiencing or living in water stressed uh, regions. So uh, the, the solution that we propose deals with harvesting water from desert air or harvesting water from air where there is, as you can see here, um, many much uh, water in, 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 the, in the atmosphere as much as we have water in rivers and lakes on our planet. So there's plenty of water and this water, if we can harvest it, it's recyclable, of course, it's in a, it, it would be a new uh, resource for um, water supplying the world, especially the water stressed regions. Now, harvesting water from air is not really a new idea. It's been uh, implemented before, but for, high, for regions of high humidity. It's exactly where you don't want to necessarily harvest water. So you'll find a lot of different companies and a lot of different products in the market, but they all work at relative humidity greater than 60%. Well, in the desert, the relative humidity most of the year is less than 60%, much less. It goes down to almost 7% relative humidity. So there's nothing out there that works below 60%. And so we can make moths that work in these red regions that you see here, where the other technologies don't work most of the year, okay? Then we, have, we would have addressed a major issue in the world. So, so if you could design moths that work in these red regions, well, they'll work also in other regions of the world. So if they work at low humidity, they certainly will work at higher humidity. And so really the vision is, could we harvest water from air anywhere in the world at any time of the year? And this uh, we discovered back in two, and reported in back in 2014, we discovered that one member of the moth family, moth A01, uh, takes up water at very low humidity. This is around 20% relative humidity. And there's, there are several things that are unique about this. One is that it has a knee behavior, which means that there's a cooperativity in the way this material takes up water. And you can release the water at 45 degrees. So this gave us the idea that perhaps we could design uh, or use this moth to take up water in the desert at night. And then during the day with the heat from the sunlight, you can remove the water and harvest drinking water. Uh, so we have the material, the rest is just uh, engineering. So we showed that in fact, the water can go up, uh, can go into the pore and out reversibly. And in this particular experiment, we showed 80 cycles with no imprint left on the material. 
Now there was, after the first uptake and release, you see a drop. Just after the first cycle, you see a little drop. And that drop turns out to be, and this is the nice thing about working with uh, crystalline materials being able to achieve crystallinity in these extended structures that one can go in using neutron diffraction, extra diffraction, identify where the first water molecules are residing into the structure. And you see here, this is a tetrahedral arrangement of water molecules in one of the pores that are in this MOF 801. And as you add more water, as more water goes in, you make, uh, you make cubic forms of of water. It turns out these are the seeds that form in the moth. And without crystallinity, you cannot detect these, these seeds. Um, these seeds are absolutely necessary for that cooperative effect where the seeds attract other water molecules in a cooperative fashion and to fill the pores with, uh, with water. So we wanted to demonstrate that this works outside the laboratory and showed that in fact, um, a, a very simple device employing MOF, um, two grams of MOFs in this case, two grams of MOF, uh, at night it takes up water from, from air and during the day you close the box and when you close the box, the temperature increases inside the box and so does uh, the water coming out of the, of the MOF. You see here droplets of water increasing in size. This was a very exciting proof of principle that the moth works outside the lab in humidity. In this particular case, the humidity is around 20%, uh, relative humidity is of 20%. Then we moved on to another study where we wanted to show that even a larger system, a kilogram of moth, in this case, moth 801 again, could be used in this type of device where you have a box within a box. Again, at night, desert air goes in, water is trapped in the pores of the moth. During the day, you close it. Sunlight heats up the interior. The difference between the outside temperature and the inside temperature condenses the water you collect the water, okay? This is, this is a very simple plexiglass device, box within a box, all made from plexiglass. And you can deliver uh, 200 to 300 milliliters of water per kilogram of moth per day, okay? With no uh, input of power, no uh, extra energy being put in to the system aside from ambient sunlight. Okay. This is pretty powerful because it demonstrates that the moth works in real life conditions in the desert. And this is, this is the water that was harvested. And I think... All right, ready, two, three, action. Cheers. Nice. Okay, so Eugene uh, drank the water. We tested the water before he drank it. And, uh, and showed that in fact, it contains no detectable metals or organics or any other contaminants. The MOF itself is a molecular filter. It excludes everything except water. And because of its rod SBU, it is very stable in, in water. Here's another MOF, MOF 303. In that MOF, it's a zirconium MOF. This MOF is an aluminum MOF, much cheaper. Um, and this MOF we can design to work even better than the MOF 801 I just showed you. And it is this MOF that we have designed cartridges of um, MOF where uh, this, is another, this is another prototype with cartridges of MOFs and designed in such a way that air can come in in one direction to, tr to trap water in the moth and then in the other direction, we could remove the water and harvest, harvest the liquid water. This was tested in the Mojave Desert, the driest desert in North America. And I want you to focus on the relative humidity in the desert during the day and during the, uh, excuse me, during the night and during the day, and it can go down to almost 7% relative humidity. You can see that the moth harvests water uh, all the time. 
okay, day and night. Obviously, during the day when it's really hot and the humidity is low, you harvest less. During the night, you harvest more. Ignore this point because that's the water that went in the moth into the desert from Berkeley. So this is, this is not to be considered, but you can see here the moth operating uh, by taking up water at very, very low humidities. So using this device, we were able to deliver, uh, this is now uh, one liter of water per kilogram of moth. And you see here the water being harvested in real, in real time, these are droplets, I hope all of you can see, can see that. Well, if you are able to uh, take the water in and out with um, great facility, then it should be possible to do many cycles during the day with, uh, let's say, using a solar panel to, to supply power for the fans that would push the air into the, into the moth. Well, it turns out that the moth takes up water, as I said, at very low humidity, but then uh, it takes it out. You see here that at 85 degrees, the water can be taken out of the pores completely in, with, within the course of five minutes. So this allows you to then really do many, many uh, cycles during the day. And so this is the latest uh, prototype that we have been working on. It looks complicated, but it's really not. There's the moth is put in cartridges here, and you will see the, in the operation that water is, uh, goes in and then harvested at the bottom. I will show you an animation now. Let's see if this, um, let me turn off the, 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 the door open, air goes in. Now the, now the moth is being filled with water. Uh, that's a collection area. And now the moth rotates, is being evacuated. Moth, the water is being collected at the bottom. And you see it here filling up the flask. Okay, now this device delivers four liters of water for each 100 grams of moth. Okay, so for each 100 gram of moth, you're uh, delivering four liters of water per day. Um, and so that tells you that with the proper engineering, you can get to in this case, 40 liters per kilogram of moth per day. But if you calculate the capacity of moth CO3, we should be able to get to 100 liters per kilogram of moth per day. And so this is the progress we've been making. Uh, we are looking very recently at around 80 liters per kilogram of moth per day. That's real water. And I think that it's a, it's a game changer in this, uh, ability to extract water from, from desert air. Well, um, based on that data, one can calculate um, different parts of the world where, you know, the, the Atacama Desert in Chile is extremely dry, but you see that our moth, even in the driest time of the year, still delivers significant amounts of water. And it does so in the Mojave Desert, I showed you the prototype, uh, Lanzhou, China, Kabul, Riyadh, Baghdad, New York, Stockholm, Los Angeles, London, Granada, Rome, Perth, in all kinds of climates, you're able to deliver um, water using this, this uh, construct. Now, obviously, we have tested this only in the desert uh, climates, but clearly, if they work in the desert, they should work in, in um, other more humidified uh, regions of the world. So what we're looking at here is really a distribution of um, uh, water supply to the world where you are in control of your water. It's personalized, it's pure, and perhaps we can achieve water independence and making water really a human right for every individual in the world to have and control. That's, that's the vision. I think we're very close here to realizing a working device that could be commercialized. And it's really the result of controlling the strong bond and reticular chemistry. 
making moths, coughs, and other materials, and opening really a very wide space uh, for the design and tailor-made uh, materials. Now, I have two slides here just to show you what the future holds. If you can functionalize the pores and still maintain crystallinity and definition, then we're able to design the pores so that they can behave almost like enzymes. Here's an, here is a, an enzyme TEV protease that is designed by nature to cleave this amide bond. And now by modifying the pore of the mouth, we can do exactly the same. So this is, this is just an, uh, the second material that could do this beyond, beyond the enzyme. So the, there is the enzyme and there is the moth designed to be like the enzyme that can do very specific operation. I think that we will see more and more of this to do uh, reactions of this kind within the pores of moth. Another area is that not only can you make these rod SBUs from one metal, you could make them from 10 different metals. And then the question arises, what is the sequence of these metals and what's, and could we, depending on the sequence, could we design materials that would be sequence dependent materials in their function? So that we would design a certain sequence to code for a specific property. The, but first we wanted to characterize what the sequences are. And we have done this with atom probe tomography in a very simple system that has cobalt and cadmium, cobalt in blue and cadmium in pink. And this would be a single crystal of this moth that is made from rod SBUs. And each line you see here is really a chain, is one of those rods. And the colors are the order or the sequence of the, of, of, that we have found for these metals. So I think the vision of being able to design sequences, let's say like nucleotides in DNA, within MOPs and COFs to be able to code for specific properties is real. And I think we're making a, a, an important step here in being able to characterize these. So you see the reticular chemist is really just a chemist that works uh, on the atom and molecular level, but now also on the framework level, but also is a, is, a, is a chemist that works in organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry, but also engineering. You saw that we are taking these materials all the way to applications. And, and this, is, this defines the reticular chemist. It's a new kind of chemist. And I say here, new kind of chemist that extends chemistry from the atom and the molecule to the framework and meeting the new intellectual and practical challenges of the 21st century. I believe that these materials uh, now are the materials of choice to address the carbon problem in the world, uh, hydrogen storage uh, issues of the world, and I just showed you the example of water. So perhaps these are the materials of the 21st century that will address the environmental, clean energy, sustainability, and water problems facing the world. So finally, I want to acknowledge our uh, funding sources and collaborators. And of course, in addition to the students that I have acknowledged throughout my presentation, my research group, and thank you for the invitation and for your attention. Omar, thank you very much. This is super exciting. So I want to ask you a question, this but also link back to uh, uh, Professor Andrew Gam. Maybe let's do this. Let's bring back uh, all the speakers, uh, Andrea yeah. and uh, Judy. Do you want to come back to the panel? Omar, do you want to unshare the screen? Let me also invite uh, our nano letter Editor-in-Chief Terry Odom to join in the panel discussion. Let me start by asking the first question. Uh, Terry will have other questions to ask you. First question, uh, Andrea and Omar, right, more related to you. Both of you talk about this, this uh, empty space structure. I want to come back to this. Omar, you showed this amazing example, harvesting water from the air. Well, Andrea, you are showing the capillary condensation. I want two of you brainstorm a little bit. What you study right here, whether this, you know, some common thinking can enhance the water harvesting from the air even more. And you, for example, right? The, you, you show this a very tiny empty space. 
really help you under the humidity and get the water in. OMA, can you utilize the uh, endurance uh, uh, capillary condensation effect to enhance water harvesting? That's my first question. Well, I mean, I think that capillary condensation is, is already operating within the pores. The pores are on the order of uh, 10 to 15 angstroms. So they are within what uh, uh, professional absorption uh, call microporosity. Anything below 20 angstrom is called microporous and you should expect to see uh, um, uh, this accumulation of water and, and uh, ultimately um, capillary condensation is observed when you go above, I'm sorry, above 20 angstroms in, in, uh, in the size of the pore. So if you have pores that are larger than 20 angstroms, you will see capillary condensation. Below, below 20 angstroms, we see that the pores are filled. Um, whether they are liquid or not, we also see their crystal, we also examine their crystal structure. We, we, we can see the water molecules using neutron diffraction, X-ray diffraction, the very first water molecules, and then how the structure of water evolves within the pores. Now, what I thought uh, Andre, Andre's talk was so amazing because a physicist is looking at these unusual effects. And here I am a chemist that can perhaps create by design those fluctuations in the matter making up the pores for these effects to be to be introduced into the into the moth so i i think that that uh, e you're picking on a very important direction is that here we have well defined materials that are designable that perhaps can test also andres uh, new uh, findings by designing fluctuations, by designing these uh, uh, rugged surfaces to, to, to get the ballistic flow of, of gases and, and, and so on that he was discussing. Yeah, Andre, you have comments on this? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, nature doesn't know whether it's physics or chemistry, it's different approximations, but uh, 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 whether you have uh, a view on the pores from the point of view of OMA, in which case water molecules go into those pores and stuck uh, to the surfaces. From my point of view of physics, I, my starting point is from macroscopic capillaries, which OMA calls larger than 30 nanometers. And I try to extra extend those approximations into the regime where really microscopic where chemistry and physics are badly defined. So uh, already I make this step in my presentations and instead of this macroscopic uh, qualities like surface tension, I use interaction energy between water molecules and pores. And uh, this is, uh, kind of chemistry domain, but uh, everything is connected. I believe that in uh, uh, the same physics occurs in those pores of, uh, of OMA, there would be commensurability effects, there would be kind of shrinking of the material, presumably maybe already observed that the structure a little bit plays when water absorbs inside and so on. And maybe what the physics, not utilitarian, not applying point of view, I was suggesting in our talk and in my research in general, this kind of simplistic picture from physics, maybe not so simplistic, but simplified view described by simple equations could be helpful by people working in chemistry to have another alternative view on what they observe from their chemistry point of view. Thank you. I think Andrew. in some ways that you can just all call it nanoscience. You don't 
don't have to be a physicist or a chemist or a we are talking about angstrom size rather than nano sub nano but all work you can always go down powers of ten so, so we are looking for angstrom lattice <laughs> next time <laughs> Well, Terry, you have questions you want to? Uh... Yeah, so I wanted to thank uh, the speakers and Eve for putting together this terrific panel where we learned a lot about surfaces and, you know, really confinement, wh where things happen, whether it's uh, on, on the surface of a topological insulator or what uh, uh, Omar and Andre has been uh, also talking about. Um, this is sort of a, a general uh, question, maybe for, for everyone, um, is, it seems that we have become more sophisticated in designing uh, materials. I'll just use Omar as an example because he pointed this out explicitly, where you almost have an infinite periodic table to make almost anything that you want. You have some well-defined uh, design rules. Um, you've talked about some se sequence-dependent design, but what is um, what are the big, big problems uh, in that will drive materials discovery or the organization of materials to solve a different type of problem that maybe we haven't thought about yet. Is that a is that to me, Terry? It's it's sort of to everyone. You can start be, uh, because sure. you were the last speaker, just related to these, you know, periodic table. You're defining a new type of periodic table. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we shouldn't take anything for granted. When I was a student making a new material was a sh really a shake and bake approach. You, you just took two things together, you mixed them up, you heat them up, you got what you got and you couldn't modify it. What particular chemistry is bringing to the table for the last 25 years is really the ability to take the precision that we use in molecular chemistry and take it to the materials domain. And, and is taking it in a, in a way that allows you to continue the values of chemistry. And that is definition of the structure, crystallinity. The second thing is that your compound has a chemical formula and which we learned in general chemistry, a chemical formula with definitive uh, proportions, molar ratios. That's a powerful concept. And so it's not just a material, a material where you don't have uh, a definitive chemical formula, right? It's a homogeneous material that has a definitive, it's a compound that now anyone in the world can make and make exactly the same compound and address it in the same way. This is, this is not to be taken for granted. That's what we have been very hard at work. And so, so yes, it has really covered the whole periodic table. It has engaged uh, organic chemistry as a whole in terms of the building units and in terms of the actions we can do. Um, I think where this is heading is that it's going to change the way chemistry is done. Because now you have this infinite space and it's possible space, okay? It's not like a multi-step synthesis of an organic molecule. It's just a one-step reaction to get to explore all this space. I think that uh, digitization of what we're doing, robotics, and, and AI is going to figure prominently in the future. And I do think that if we can implement it in reticular chemistry, that it will spill over to the rest of chemistry and take us out of this world where we are now. Uh, you know, we're still uh, practicing chemistry like it was a hundred years ago. If you go into our labs, our students go into the lab and the tools that they have uh, to rely on for their discoveries are still the same kind of tools we had a hundred years ago. So why not bring the AI, bring robotic tools to be a routine tool, just like an IR machine that might be in my lab or an X-ray machine. They are tools to help students, to help our researchers um, transform chemistry and bring it to the modern stage. Great, thank you. Uh, Judy? Uh, yeah, so organic organic chemists, I mean, I think it's amazing what you can do and it's design, you, you tailor design it and you go ahead and make exactly what you design. You have steps and you have recipes, you figure all of this out. I think in material science and solid state materials, in quantum materials in general, I think we're, much, we're very much 
still in the shake and bake type realm, right? So, and, you know, breaking down to the molecular units or the crystalline units and how to assemble it together to exactly make what I had envisioned is not there in material science or solid state physics. And I think, how, how do we do that? I don't know, but how do we do that? I think we'll really make a big difference. Um, another thing is, uh, so this is maybe something organic chemists have already figured out, right? So we know, we know the beginning, we know the end, but how do you get there? How do you get there? It can be multiple pathways, multiple energetic states, multiple nucleation barriers, right? Multiple synthetic pro processes, which one is the best? Which one maybe is least energy consumption or the best crystalline quality at the end, right? So in terms of um, theoretical help, whether it's AI driven or just traditional approach, looking at actual reaction pathways, the entire you know, reaction coordinates, I think will be helpful from the theoretical standpoint, right? Um, computational standpoint. Oh, sorry. And then the one last thing. At the end, a lot of real materials contain quite a bit of defects. Um, and a lot of properties are driven by defects. Um, so uh, studies of defects and defect engineering, we say a lot of times defect engineering, but often maybe what we mean by defect engineering is removing defects as much as possible, not really controlling those defects and the types and then densities. But that's certainly very important and critical and especially at the nanoscale because the you know the relative defect number of defects that make up your uh, entire uh, sample is large yeah so uh, thank you judy for the uh, comment uh, i would say that if you have a crystalline material detecting defects is a lot easier than if it's not so so the again the crystallinity is not just an obsession of mine uh, but it's, a, it's an essential property to move the science forward. Uh, for example, if you, if you don't have crystallinity, you will not get those water seeds and you will not get that isotherm. You can make that same compound and you make it with more defects and make it uh, uh, less crystalline. You will not see this nice step isotherm, which you absolutely need for harvesting water from desert air. So crystallinity is very important. Now, the control is another aspect because there, some uh, as, uh, researchers in reticular chemistry have been able to design defects, to take, to yank out an SBU, sometimes in a periodic way, and put something else in. Uh, and, or do crystal to crystal transformation by taking out a linker, putting another linker in. So this is, this is, again, this is a result of the fact that you can identify what you've done due to crystallinity, but also there is control because you control the chemistry. That, that's, so those are, so I, I guess the way the reticular chemistry could impact nano is that now really you bring chemistry, the old fashioned chemistry principles into nano, which is high definition, uh, I would say uh, precisely defined uh, uh, units as chemical compounds, nano, nanoscale units as chemical compounds. And you begin to use this intermediate uh, regime as a chemistry regime that you can control based on original chemistry principles that are still valid and still very powerful. Uh, it's, but you're right. I mean, I don't think nano is yet there because the, si the size regime is a, is a difficult regime to control. But I think that we have to insist on asking those difficult questions. Um, for so this, Omar, yeah. this is a very exciting. I think three of you, uh, uh, I know this can get getting late for Andrea and also for Asia. If this is exciting, you cannot fall asleep. Um, so what about this? Let's, uh, I think we have to end today's uh, panel discussion for the time consideration. Um, but let me advertise the next event on December 10th. It's Thursday. We changed the agenda a little bit, not on Friday anymore, it's on Thursday. 
this will be the last event of the year. Um, we will have our own editor-in-chief, Terry Odom, to be one of the speakers. Uh, the other senior speaker is Paul Wise, the editor of ACS Nano, plus a young, new young star, uh, Professor Ang Schumann Nag, uh, the third person. Uh, December 10th, the same time, 7 a.m. California time, I'd like to welcome everybody to come back to uh, listen to this Nanoscience Global Lecture. Thank you very much, Andrea, Omar, and Judy. This is fantastic talk. Thank you. <laughs>